Welcome everyone to this exciting event. We're coming to you live from Melbourne Connect, Melbourne's newest innovation precinct. I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land Melbourne Connect is built upon. I would also like to pay respect to the elders both past and present of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present. Melbourne Connect will be a hub for students, industry, government and academia to engage in collaborative innovation. We've created purpose-built research facilities and spaces to come together to solve some of our biggest challenges, focusing on AI, digital and data capabilities. We are so thrilled to have our long-standing partners, the City of Melbourne, Telstra and Cisco at Melbourne Connect to discuss this important topic. How can we use technology to sustainably reinvigorate our city? I'd like to formally welcome our City of Melbourne Lord Mayor, Sally Cap, Nikos Katinakis, the Group Executive for Networks and IT at Telstra, Simon Young, the General Manager of Transport and Infrastructure at Cisco, and Professor Elaine Wong, Associate Dean, Diversity and Inclusion in the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology here at the University of Melbourne. I look forward to your thoughts and insights on the way forward for technology with Melbourne as a centrepiece. Now I'd like to hand over to Professor Tass Nermalatas. Tass is the director of the Wireless Innovation Lab, a new initiative just launched, and he'll be leading our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for that warm welcome. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this exciting panel session at Melbourne Connect, a brand new innovation precinct. As Mark mentioned, my name is Tas Nimalatis. I'm a professor of electrical and electronic engineering and currently lead wireless innovation lab. Some of you might know my previous role as the director of the Interdisciplinary Research Institute, Melbourne Network Society Institute, uh, focusing on the societal challenges through connectivity lens. Today, our panel of experts will discuss the innovations that can fast track the city's transition towards a sustainable, economically resilient and socially responsible future. We have a beautiful city, a city well known for its facilities and lifestyle, attracting large scale events, a city enjoying the benefits of concentration of knowledge workers and innovative businesses. A city with amazing creative talent and performing venues. A city known for its sports facilities and events. A city with a rich history of indigenous knowledge and culture. A city with significant heritage. In fact, one of the most livable cities in the, around the world. COVID-19 presented the city with significant challenges. As we embrace those challenges and respond to opportunities created by the significant disruption to our lives, economy, environment, and culture. The panel session seek to explore the city, how it will invigorate itself through the adoption of technological innovations. As you can see, the topic is broad in, broad in uh, broad scope, and therefore these panel sessions would not be able to do justice to address everything that is really uh, critical to that topic but we hope this will be a conversation starter that will be uh, followed up with further discussions uh, in the future. Before we um, dive right into the panel session, I just wanted to um, remind everyone that we will be live tweeting today's session. So please join in in the conversation by using hashtag UNIMELB, U-N-I-M-E-L-B. We also have a graphic artist, Madison Kitching, here uh, with us today who will be live scribing the sessions. I also like to remind that this event is being recorded and will be available on our website um, eng.unimalb.edu.au in the coming days. Okay, let's dive straight into the panel discussions. First up, we have City of Melbourne's um, Lord Mayor Sally Cap. 
Lord, the Lord Mayor was re-elected as the Lord Mayor of Melbourne in October 2020. As Melbourne grows, she is committed to ensuring it remains a caring and thoughtful city as well as a prosperous one. According to Lord Mayor's recent tweet, she says, Melbourne is at its best when people come together and get stuck into the amazing experiences on offer, whether it is cities dining, an exhibition, a live music event, or a fashion show. Get into the city or get four more. <laughs> we are thrilled to have the Lord Mayor with us today to talk about the city's plans in getting people into the city and out of FOMO, enjoying what it has to offer. Could I now kindly ask the Lord Mayor to tell us more about her current work? Thank you, Thass. And on behalf of the City of Melbourne, I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which the City of Melbourne is located, the Bunurong, Bunurong and the Wurundjeri, Wurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation and pay our respects to their elders and to the elders who have introduced so much innovation to this land on which we gather today. Well, a great introduction, thank you. Uh, Melbourne really does pride itself on being a dynamic city, constantly seeking innovative ways in which we can anticipate and meet uh, the many changing needs of the community, the economy and the environment. The city has, of course, drastic, dramatically changed uh, as a result of COVID. Um, but we can really take to heart these sorts of conversations that are happening here at Melbourne Connect. We're the first one, so congratulations in this fantastic new space uh, that represents a collaboration as well. And I think they're the sorts of things that we can take to heart uh, as a beacon of hope for a better future for all of us. The pandemic has created a really interesting dichotomy here uh, in the city. There are so many aspects uh, that have been accelerated and developments that have been accelerated as a result of COVID. Uh, but then, of course, many parts of our economy are completely at a standstill. We know that innovation and technology can make a huge difference. Uh, even when the economy contracts, it can help us take big leaps forward. Pre-COVID, our city was already being digitally disrupted. Uh, Industry 4.0, of course, the Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles, AI, AR, VR, DC. I could throw a whole lot of other letters in there. Uh, that disruption uh, um, was happening. But uh, the pandemic has really put digitisation and our appreciation, I think, of how we can use technology absolutely on steroids. Now, one of my great oracles that I like to listen to is Homer Simpson. Uh, he calls these sorts of situations a crisis-tunity and it is up to us to absolutely take advantage uh, of uh, what we're experiencing at the moment, that leverage. We know that we need to reimagine Melbourne's economy, uh, looking at new types of jobs and businesses. Looking forward to hearing about more of that today. We need to reconsider the way that our city operates and actually look for improvements uh, that can change uh, the efficiency and the effectiveness of the way our city operates. And of course, this is a reset where we can look to actually embed more around sustainability and environment, social equity and needs in our community. And we can't miss this chance. The pandemic turned the community and the city of Melbourne as an organisation our operations digital almost overnight. We had 1,400 of our staff, 37% of who'd been previously enabled to work through technology from home to 85% of that workforce now digitally enabled. We held events and we even did citizenship ceremonies using Zoom. Uh, the use of our e-libraries has absolutely skyrocketed and we have uh, digitised more of our council services, which frankly we should have been doing much earlier. We've ramped up production of our own data and I'm going to share some of that with you and really are looking to increase the sort of insight that can be driven from tools using our open data platform. Uh, of course, all of this is to encourage more invention and improvement uh, across our city. 
Earlier this month, for example, we've been using our pedestrian sensors daily. I don't know if anybody else is obsessed with it as we are, uh, but it does show that, for example, when we're looking at the investment in major events like Moomba, we can use that the pedestrian sensors to give us a good reading of the impact. We know that the number of pedestrians around Alexandra Gardens and that part of South Bank increased 392% on the four-week average uh, over that week. Weekend. We know that 47% of our shop fronts in Docklands are empty at the moment and we are monitoring our shop fronts using an app that we developed uh, during COVID uh, and we're doing that so that we can work to activate those shop fronts through programs such as Shopkeeper. Melbourne's recovery from the pandemic is heavily reliant on great ideas and the energy of people and we want to be able to deploy those swiftly. Uh, technology provides many of the opportunities to get us there. It's important that we acknowledge that we don't have all the answers at the City of Melbourne and the time for collaboration in 2021 uh, is needed more than ever. We are looking for all of the best and brightest uh, of ideas. That's why we're calling on all innovators, entrepreneurs, students, faculty, staff, uh, business leaders uh, and the wider community to get involved in identifying those solutions. We have an open innovation competition uh, that kicks off uh, oh, I'm going to tell you about that in a moment, but I just wanted to say it was an idea that came through many of the forums that we ran during COVID online to say how can we rethink the way that we use spaces in the city, how can we be, uh, how can we support more technology enabled solutions. Uh, and one of the ideas was basically to have a giant hackathon, which all of you will be very familiar with. Uh, we want to see, I, I had it here when that is starting, I'm sure I'm going to come to it, it's, it's any second, I think it's next week. Uh, Nick, you can tell me that by the time I finish this, I'm sure. Uh, we want to see our open data used across our platform uh, by a wider group of people uh, and we want to overcome some of those city conundrums that have previously been thought too difficult, too complex, too costly to overcome, such as congestion on our roads and on our public transport and also what we can do with uh, or to help and better manage the issues being faced by rough sleepers in the city. Here it is. The competition goes live on Monday. So visit Participate Melbourne uh, and get involved. Uh, we do need everybody's input. It is uh, the reason why these sorts of forums are so important as well. The last thing I was going to mention is that we do have Australia's first local government led uh, 5G technology test bed right here in the city of Melbourne and the Melbourne Innovation District is the home for that activity. Uh, we've set up a number of uh, projects and we have 26 industry participants involved in the test bed. Despite all of the lockdowns, we were able to progress a number of initiatives they included. We now have our city circle tram fitted uh, with a microclimate sensor to better understand how temperature and humidity impact passengers and uh, the efficiency of Yarra Trams uh, employees and patrons. And we are working with the University of Melbourne on sensors that have been installed into Argyle Square for an end-to-end -end, uh, Internet of Things park experience to help us understand what's happening in those parks, uh, all legal of course, uh, and how we can improve those experiences and those activities as we go forward. We need to keep asking ourselves, what else can we do? What else might be possible? We've said we want to transform into a city of yes, where anything is possible. And we are pleased to be involved in this forum today to see how we can test and push out some of those boundaries. So thank you. Thank you. There are very uh, detailed and fantastic ideas around sensors to transport and using mobile stock to really inform the city. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Let me um, um, switch the focus to our second panelist. Um, so I'd like to introduce Simon Young from Cisco. Simon is the general manager for transport and infrastructure market in Australia and New Zealand and is part of the strategic industries development group. Simon is an industry leader in Internet of Things strategies and he's passionate about data and connectivity, bringing the best outcomes for customers and partners. Simon, 
Thank you for joining the panel today. Thanks, Daz. Uh, lovely to be here. Yeah. So um, I guess Cisco's been in the communication space for over 35 years. Uh, and to be honest, that's really around connectivity, uh, connecting everything from computers to networks to uh, mobile phones to, to video conferencing. Uh, but more recently, uh, we've been also looking at this concept of the Internet of Things. And for those that don't know, the Internet of Things is all about extending that connectivity to physical objects. So connecting people and places and, uh, and, and things together. And so out of that, the aim of that is to better understand it and provide new insights into the environment, uh, provide hyper-awareness of behaviour uh, around asset performance that then drives uh, insights and decision making and makes for fast execution of uh, actions as well. So Cisco has been focusing uh, that IoT particular aspect around how do we improve and digitise the transport market uh, and certainly transform it. And uh, unfortunately, if you, I guess if you look at the pandemic, it, it's been a real driver and accelerator of technology, which we're now riding. I think, in fact, they've coined the term tech acceleration uh, now in terms of what's happening, which is, which is good. Um, but uh, I think it really means that, that we need to be committed to connecting as many uh, people, places, ideas and, and things as much as possible and help uh, better understand changes in behaviour as we move through the process um, and also the environment as well. Um, simple things such as also using that data that we extract out of it to help build confidence to, to get people back onto public transport and also the city itself. So, just to run through a few examples here, uh, we're working very closely with the Ames Test Bed, which is obviously uh, run by the University of Melbourne and is actually just quite close to here in, in Carlton. Uh, and we've been doing some aspects of digitisation there. If you have a look at the, the picture on the screen now, what we're doing things such as understanding how many people are waiting uh, for taxis, uh, how many taxis are, are waiting in line and therefore helping to understand supply and demand, how many people are waiting at a bus stop, connecting buses together, helping understand how many people are on the bus so we can uh, instill confidence that people can achieve social distancing, um, even to the, the point of helping to understand uh, traffic flow as well as people change uh, their habits. Maybe some people feel, again, less confident about taking public transport and, and maybe more around um, uh, riding to work as well. Um, and this digitisation is really important. Again, it's about opening up the city and infrastructure to communicate back to the community to take some de details from them, but also to push back and, and provide um, a really, I guess, innovative way to interact with it. So case in point, uh, another example that we just did uh, here on the Ames test bed in Carlton is we've set it up so that the traffic lights can actually communicate to vehicles. It's a precursor to autonomous vehicles, which are a little bit further down the track, but uh, is a good example of infrastructure and the city communicating to people. and and. and uh, to, to build out on that. It could be such as a vehicle's coming along a path, it can't see that there's a pedestrian uh, walking across, and that traffic light, that intersection would communicate back to that vehicle and say, hey, watch out, you know, there, there's something happening. But it's bi-directional. The vehicle could also communicate back to the traffic light and say, hey, I saw a, a particular incident down the road. So that's a great example of what digitisation can bring, and you can expand that across to the city so it becomes a living city communicating with the community uh, as well. Um, so that's really what we're looking at, and, and I guess the last point around that and, and to, to, um, to the Lord Mayor's point around the hackathon, uh, the digitization is really just an enablement layer. The real value of it is around the applications at the top. So opening it up, uh, opening up the data to the broader community and getting them to innovate across the top with those applications are really the key to helping uh, reinvigorate and create that resilient sort of community. Yeah. Thanks, Simon. That, that's really um, very informative about the, how we're going to digitize and take create value out of the, the, the enabler of uh, digitization platform. And you also talked about the connectivity as being critical. So that um, takes us to the next panelist. Um, so we are really pleased to have Nikos um, Katanakis um, with us here. So thank you, Nikos. Um, so Nikos joined Tulstra in 2018 as Group Executive Networks and IT. Nikos is responsible for ensuring Telstra delivers the next generation network technologies to create the largest, the smartest, and most reliable networks in the world. Nikos shared in an article that he has had a, quite a journey since joining Telstra and has become accustomed to his words, according to his words, dealing with the weirdness from bushfires to floods to COVID-19. Welcome to Australia, 
uh, Nikos. Um, he has led the Telstra through some major disruptions. Welcome, Nikos. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, nice to meet everybody. It's quite a topic that we're discussing today. I mean, I remember I've only been here for two years and a bit, and uh, uh, despite the name and the accent, I come from Canada. So as you can imagine, when you say, hey, how, how does it compare? I'll, I'd say Australia is very much like Canada, except it has better weather. There's another thing, and not everything is out to get you in Canada, where everything is out to get you in Australia. <laughs> Spiders and snakes and sharks and weather and floods, and it's amazing. So, so this, this disruption so obviously came to a, a bit of an interesting point last year when COVID happened. And to Lord Mayor's point, uh, we, we shut down the company in effect over a weekend where 25,000 people moved to working from home, literally, over a Sunday. Massive numbers. And everything worked, which is great. And, uh, you know, you, you look around the, the country and you can see a lot of organizations struggled to do that transition, which is not a good thing. So point number one, we have to be able to activate that capability so everybody can work from anywhere. Interesting, uh, as we fast forward now, we have a lot of discussions about the future of the workplace. And by definition, that means what happens to, to the CBD. Uh, we moved to Melbourne when we moved from Canada because we automatically loved the city. We, we didn't even bother going to Sydney. Yay. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't look at Brisbane. We didn't look at anything. We just said Melbourne is the place to go. And we, we have been fascinated with uh, the good infrastructure that the city has and the very livable uh, style. And we love the CBD because that's where everything happens. But if you pull the workforce away from the CBD, what does it imply? What does the CBD become? And I think, I think that's where a lot of the thinking has to go because the, the city is the CBD in many ways. And um, although a lot of us live in the suburbs, uh, we do come here for entertainment, for the sports, for the fashion show. My wife is going tonight, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it, it's life itself. So connectivity then enables all of that. And as we talk about sensors or IoT or measuring footfall, uh, if you don't have the right connectivity, nothing works. And even at the Australian level, we talk a lot about the digital economy. You, re you remove the word digital, there is no economy anymore. I mean, we, we, we see even taxi drivers have thrown out the, you know, the manual credit card checks because if, if you can't tap, forget it. You can't, you can't even take a taxi anymore. So all of these things point to how important connectivity has become because now it is critical for the economy. Now underneath the, uh, connectivity comes the word resiliency because it's nice to have a connection at home or at work. If that connection doesn't work, we're in trouble. Um, working for Telstra, everybody loves Telstra, but everybody has a story about Telstra. Some phone call that didn't go well, some installation that went south. We totally get it. Uh, 30 million calls a year plus, 100,000 of them go wrong. It, it's, it's natural. But what has happened during the last year is that um, the sensitivity of people has increased. Before, you know, if your Netflix got through a, you know, a hourglass for a little while or, you know, you're on Teams or WebEx or whatever and you have a blip, ah, it's okay, whatever, you know, three seconds later you back up. Now, if you're on a call with the boss and that happens, you get upset because that's a very, very important video call yet you don't want to drop. So the sensitivity has increased and it points to how important that resiliency has become. The other thing, of course, is uh, we have been deploying 5G. It's, uh, it's one of these keywords these days. We have, uh, we have exceeded actually 60% plus of the, pops, of the population of Australia covered. Um, we are going to be over 75% by the end of June. That puts Australia truly at the forefront of the global map. It's, I, I get phone calls all, all the time from vendors and other carriers around the globe as to how are we doing it and how can we go so fast. What does this mean for all of us? 
the capability is tremendous. I, I, I ran a speed test outside the, the building as I was walking in before I met Mark. Uh, I, I got about 600 megabits per second. That's about 600 a day, six times what I get at home from my fixed connection. So what do you do with this capability? Of course you can connect sensors, of course you can connect everything. And you can collect a ton of data and put them in a massive data lake and look at it. What do you do? So I think the, the next important step is define the problems we want to solve. Because it's nice to collect data. If you don't know what you're solving for, it's just data piling up and costing money, right? Uh, and of course, to, to Simon's point, I, I love the chart that you put up, uh, Simon, because the top layer, the applications, is the next step of importance. And one observation, and I'm not picking on anybody, we just have too many applications. I have four just to decide which tram or train to take. It doesn't quite make sense, right? So if I want to interact with the city, it's got to be simple because if I have a thousand applications I need to navigate to how to do it, it becomes complicated. And what it drives is lack of adoption. So how many of us in the audience have an application that tells you uh, when the train is coming by? Now compare probably everybody. Compare that to how many of us in the audience have an application that tells them what's the best way to go from point A to point B in the city using buses, trams, trains, walk. Maybe 20% at best. Why not being the same? It's that adoption, I think, that's going to drive that connectedness uh, in the city and drive all the benefits that we're looking for. And my last comment, what are the benefits? What are we talking about? So there are lots of studies about what a connected city can benefit from. Anything from crime uh, prevention or reduction, energy reduction, cost of living reduction, uh, transport time reduction, uh, energy, uh, gas, green gas emissions uh, reduction. The benefits are amazing. I mean, healthcare online, blah, blah, blah. So you, can, you can go on and on for hours on the benefits you can drive if you have that adoption on top of the right applications and, and data. So that's, that's my story. But Great to be you. here. Uh, that's what we are trying to focus within Wireless Innovation Lab, is really focusing on applications of immense capabilities of wireless that what it delivers to the society. So thank you, Nikos. And let me um, switch to Elaine Wong. Uh, um, now last, not but least, uh, I would like to introduce my colleague, collaborator, Professor Elaine Wong from the University of Melbourne. Elaine is an electrical engineer specializing in op optical fiber communications and optical networking. Elaine is also um, Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion within the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology. Elaine is very passionate about equality, access and inclusion, and in particular, ensuring the development and the use of technologies, including diverse views, knowledge and experience. Welcome, Elaine. Thank you very much, Thas. Thank you, everyone, for the invitation. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here and very daunting to follow all the giants in the room, uh, but I'll try my best. Um, so as Thas was saying, uh, I'm Elaine Wong uh, from the University of Melbourne. And for the last three, four years, uh, we have been working on technology that uh, would allow humans to fully immerse in uh, geographically separated places, so basically remote places. So you'd ask, you know, how can you fully immerse in a place that is a uh, hundred kilometers away, for example? Uh, the answer is using proxy machines and proxy robots. And so how do we do that? So humans will talk to these robots that are hundreds of kilometers away um, through voice, video and data, and as, as importantly, um, through tactile haptic information. So we're talking about kinesthetic information we're talking about tactile information, so that humans can actually touch and feel their remote environments. So the area of research is known as tactile internet. So I hope you can uh, remember that lot, Mayor, on top of the other <laughs> acronyms. So tactile internet. And um, 
unlike, you know, IoT, the Internet of Things, um, whereby in Internet of Things, you actually take the human decision out of mundane chores. So, for example, monitoring and things like that. The tactile Internet is actually centered on the human and this human is collaborating with machines remotely to have uh, an extended skill as well as an extended experience in those geographically remote areas. So you might ask, what are these use cases? What are some of these applications? And so what we're trying to do now is to deliver these technologies into aged care, because as we know, during the lockdown, um, the residents um, have been, you know, really profoundly, you know, they were in a profound isolation, isolated cocoon. And so no contact with the outside world, World. And even with voice, video and data, that wasn't enough. And so what we're trying to do now is we're trying to roll this out into aged care and into ICUs so that patients and um, aged care residents can have that contact, uh, that, that sort of touch uh, with their family members. So how it works is you have a machine connected to the resident. Uh, there are actuators and sensors. And so any movement uh, from families that are situated, you know, hundreds of kilometers away with a tactile glove, the resident can feel that touch and at the same time you know the resident their, their movements can be tracked by family members um, hundreds of kilometers away now another use case would be in the creative arts so for example I can fully participate uh, and interact with a, an exhibition say in Madrid or in um, in Paris right whereby I can touch the sculpture that I normally wouldn't be able to. And this technology is also potentially inclusive, whereby um, people with you know, impaired vision can fully participate by um, using the sense of touch. So that's what we're looking at at the moment. So coming back to what I see um, as reinvigorating Melbourne, uh, is that you know, as I, I've lived in Melbourne for 10 years now in the city, um, although we no longer live in the city, my kids go to school in the city and I've worked in the city for 20 odd years. And uh, we were one of the lucky ones whereby we continued to work in the city um, during the lockdown. So our affinity towards the city is really, really strong. So in answering the question about, you know, what, what do you see as a reinvigorated Melbourne? I, I sort of had you know, this, this four aspirations. And I'm so glad that, you know, it really has um, a, a synergy to what the lot mayor has said prior um, to this. And also, you know, with the IoT, as well as the connectivity uh, that both my panel speakers have said. So if you can indulge me, I'll just go through um, <laughs> these pillars that I see would make, you know, Melbourne resilient um, to its, you know, future knocks and uh, future events, um, hopefully not. So the first one is um, to your left, you'll see that to me, a reinvigorated Melbourne will be one whereby we get to share um, the digital solutions, the digital content, the digital experience equally among everyone. So no one is digitally less vulnerable or more vulnerable than the other person. Uh, unfortunately, with COVID, we had to pivot to online, but that means, you know, the digital divide is, is heightened during that, that period. Not everyone had access to broadband. Not everyone had more than one device to share in the family. So what are the opportunities there? So some of the opportunities here to make sure that, you know, we close this gap and we improve our digital inclusion includes scaling up of agile on demand. So pop up, you know, Wi-Fi 6 networks um, and free high-speed Wi-Fi. Um, the other opportunities would include acceleration of digital literacy. So even if someone is able to get on the internet, they may not be technically savvy or they may not be able to fully take advantage of the digital technology. So we have to teach people to be digitally savvy. Uh, we should provide training and resources to upskill our community to understand the value of data and then have decision-making from that understanding. And we should always, and you know, and I'm, I, I know both Cisco and Telstra does it, to co-design our solutions um, so that our online services and assistive technology is truly inclusive. So that, that would be my hope uh, for a reinvigorated Melbourne. 
And if I can quickly jump onto the other pillars, uh, the second one would be to fully use the open data platform that you have said, Lord Mayor. Um, you know, for us, you know, for the whole community to understand what's on this platform, um, to improve buy-in, to improve accountability, to improve decision making. So it's very important for us to get on that platform and to see how privacy and digital rights are actually protected on that platform. I think there's a lot of um, people that are um, skeptical about, you know, data collection, aggregation, um, interpretation, analysis. So I think it, this is a very good um, sort of avenue to get the community into looking at these data. And then very quickly, um, an ecosystem of innovation. So uh, I think Simon was talking about AIMS, you know. Um, and so if we have the capacity to, to encourage more trials, more test bids, uh, more targeted co cooperation and collaboration between, you know, business owners, the community, the residents, uh, the industry providers, the technology, you know, creators, um, that would actually elevate Melbourne uh, to be, if not already, the premier, you know, location and ecosystem for innovation. And last but not least, I think Nico's touch upon it, the transformation of buildings so that it's adaptable. Um, we maximize the use, uh, we minimize the under, uh, underutilization, uh, and we improve community safety. I think it's really important, you know, with what's going on the last two weeks, that we have to look at the safety around the city um, against violence, you know, towards women or towards children. And there are technology out there. The issue is how do we integrate all this technology uh, and how do we ensure that the public um, has the confidence to use that technology? Yeah. So that's my five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. I think you've touched on very important uh, uh, points there about digital inclusiveness and in the, in the, in the pursuit of technological innovation, uh, in particular in the, in the context of city. Um, let's kind of, um, this gives us an opportunity with, you've set the scene and, and really great points there, but let's kind of dive into some of the questions uh, people have posted us before the event, but also we will also, I think we are getting a lot of questions coming in. So um, let me kind of ask a little bit of, pro, uh, you know, provoking question, uh, um, Lord Mayor, if I could uh, start with you. I think what is the compelling narrative that City of Melbourne, with, you know, I think you have uh, published a revised outlook for the city and uh, there are really great points you have targeted. Maybe it is for the benefit of all of us if you could kind of see where the city is choosing to, um, you know, focus its narrative. Mm. It's a great uh, topic. What is that compelling narrative to bring people back into the city? Is that what you mean? Good. Uh, well, we think already Melbourne has a unique... Uh, environment uh, that is not easily uh, replicated anywhere else in terms of the mix of commercial, residential, uh, the visitor economy, all of the culture, uh, the creative, uh, the ability to have major events, major sporting events, for example. Uh, all of that infrastructure, both built uh, and in terms of the organisations and investment that's here, is something that is unique and that we need to keep leveraging. Uh, we uh, know that the way in which people work and interact with the city has changed forever and uh, for a lot of people this creates fear uh, and that's understandable because change and disruption does create emotions like that. I think the most compelling part of what we can do is create a sense of of optimism and opportunism about what that disruption means and the fact that the city is open and embracing of those changes to be able to welcome the sort of uh, innovation uh, and invention and improvement, frankly, that we are talking about in this forum. If the city can provide a platform for the best and the brightest to come together to take those challenges on and turn them into positive outcomes for the city, then we think that's the sort of environment that will continue to attract uh, people from around the world, that will continue to attract investment uh, into the sorts of uh, uh, um, buildings and uh, landscapes that encourage that sort of interaction. 
We know that uh, cities uh, have, since 2007, I think it was, more people living in cities than in rural and regional areas. It's a phenomenon that took centuries uh, to come to that point, and it's certainly a phenomenon that will continue. And uh, us as a major city, not just here in Australia, but in a global context, and how we position ourselves using technology uh, to have that sort of outreach to create export opportunities uh, to be a launching pad for local talent as well uh, is really important. So that compelling narrative is that I think um, Nikos might have said earlier about the remote capability and how we deal with that. Well, from our perspective, uh, there'll be lots of things and tasks and activities that can be undertaken in a remote environment, but what is that compelling element that requires people to come together, the sparks that fly from people interacting face to face, the sort of ways in which we uh, express our values and our aspirations when people come together for events, uh, those sorts of interactions. Need, the city needs to be that place uh, where it can uh, accommodate uh, remote activity and support it, but which is the place for people coming together for those sparks to fly. The collision, I think the University of Melbourne uses. And so how we balance those two things into the future is going to be really important. Thank you. And I invite the others if there are any comments on that. I'll yeah, jump in. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Simon. No, go for it. I'll jump in. Uh, Lord Mayor, just a small challenge, just, just to make it interactive. Yeah. Um, over the past uh, six months, I think, was the first time where Melbourne actually shrunk because there were more people that moved out than came into the city. Mm. Do you think that's a trend that will continue? And if yes, as more people feel comfortable working from further out, if you will, if you will from the CBD, do we have to do something even more uh, out there to attract them back to come and entertain themselves and find the sparks, as you said, in the middle of the city. I think we do. I mean, the things that we do going forward have to have a newness or a scale or, or elements that uh, I call it surprise and delight, whether that's intellectually or that's something that you experience uh, right across the facets of, of how people want to engage. There's no doubt about that. I think we have to acknowledge as well, though, that whilst we have seen people moving uh, into more regional areas and they're choosing lifestyles because that remote working uh, is, is something that's uh, been accelerated during COVID. We've also had uh, situations where immigration has been stopped, uh, where our international students uh, haven't been able to come back into these environments. So once the vaccine rolls out and we start to see more of those normal dynamics of city inflows uh, happen again, uh, then I think we'll, we'll, we'll start to feel a bit healthier as those lungs fill. But I would say there's no doubt that it's going to be more competitive than ever the environment in which cities compete for their fair share of talent and investment. And we're very mindful of that in terms of how we position ourselves well. Um, I haven't mentioned the, the knowledge economy yet, and I really should since we're here with the, the University of Melbourne, but our $104 billion economy pre-COVID, which is actually an economy bigger than Tasmania, Northern Territory and ACT combined, which exists within this city of Melbourne. 60% uh, of that economy is really driven by the knowledge sector, which is our education, our professional services and technology. We need to use the strength of that platform to actually devise uh, these new ways of engaging these new uh, compelling elements uh, to bring people. Is it green jobs? Uh, is, it, uh, is it building on our biotech sector? Is it taking the credentials, frankly, out of COVID and the way that Australia is managed and making those sorts of things, specialisations that we can then project into the world? I think the possibilities are enormous, but it does come to those points of how we create the sort of platforms for people to be able to, uh, to uh, devise those applications of the technology and then be able to build them and uh, and take them out into the marketplace. That's going to be really important. Thank you. Thank you. 
And I think in the conversations uh, there and before, I think uh, many of you touched the, the applications that's going to be important. And one of the things is about how these applications could provide the resilience to the city and, and the people who come and work and live in the city. Um, so uh, if, you, if I could kind of seek your lens, you know, how does the city become more resilient against these type of events? Like whether it's a, we have just faced a pandemic, but we also uh, potentially have an uh, environmental effect or other things. And, but also city has security and safety challenges, as uh, Nikos, you mentioned. So um, how do we respond to or at least improve the resilience of the city? Uh, I think you guys already touched on it. Maybe it's an opportunity to kind of elaborate on some of that. Yeah, look, for, I, I guess it, it really, again, comes back down to the applications, but it comes back down to that, that quality of data. And, and what we're seeing is that first iteration of, hey, let's put out sensors and, 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 and dip our turn in the water and see what it's doing. We've passed that bit now. And I think what we're seeing is people are saying, well, we want good quality data now so we can make decisions and build those applications at the top and make a really elastic sort of uh, city out of it because now we know exactly what's happening, we know exactly what people are doing and we can start to be more malleable in terms of how we interact with it as well. So I think that that's key. Because you kind of um, mentioned the connectivity and the connectivity actually is a critical element in, in providing that uh, connection between different systems. If the system don't talk to it and to get the you know a reliable data, we can't build the application on it. Uh, so where, where do you see the uh, this driving the, the, the kind of changes in the city? And I know that you're building very fast 5G capabilities. Where do you see this taking us? I'll split uh, the question into a few parts because the, the dangers, if you will, uh, are, are many and varied, right? So I, I don't want to paint everything with one brush. So if you have, uh, you have environmental, uh, you have bushfires, you have cyber, you have all kinds of things that may render the city, um, let's say, less viable than, than it is today. Uh, I mean, sensors, of course, it's one, one way to go, always. Uh, you can measure more and more and have them forewarns you about what's happening. So anything from, uh, we've seen in other cities around the globe where we use uh, the, the radios, the base stations or the traffic lights or poles, electricity poles to install sensors that measure anything from increased uh, carbon dioxide to uh, spreading of uh, no, uh, any kind of gas that's poisonous, uh, um, too much smoke, too much UV, too much everything, right? So that you use that measurement to forewarn the citizens uh, as to what's going on. Um, cyber, I think, is an emerging, well, it's not an emerging threat, it just has become a lot bigger than before. Uh, so, so a lot of activity these days, and we have seen uh, a tremendous number of targeted attacks on CEOs of organizations and small medium businesses where they get locked up by malware and they just can't do anything. Um, I think it's an opportunity for all of us to help not only digitize the small medium business sector of the city, but also help them protect themselves from that external threat because it's nice to have a, an all-inclusive digital platform that you can facilitate any transaction. If you're locked up with malware, you, don't, you can't do anything. And, and that's, that's something that it's emerging more and more. And of course, finally, um, I think the opportunity, and I'm going to go to Elaine's points around art and culture, etc. I, I think there's something to be said about how do we make all these beautiful things that we have in the city a lot more resilient and a lot more accessible in times of strife. Uh, I, I'm a big uh, dance and ballet proponent. I, I love the theater and I love all these things. I, I've missed it. It would have been fantastic if we had an AR, VR version of uh, XYZ plays that you can access. And I think that's, that's also going to the competitiveness of the city globally, because I think more and more people will download or watch a play out of Los Angeles, uh, why not out of Melbourne? And I think, I think that's one way to make the city a lot more resilient in, in, in that sector. Yeah. 
And I, I might just, given that you mentioned, I might come back to you, Elaine. You mentioned about the use of social robots and then, you know, to really provide that touch in a touchless society kind of context. It's an interesting dimension there. You know, we're trying to remove the touch, but at the same time, you want to create right. people feeling um, touched and connected. Correct. So do you see that uh, those will be further away in the future or is actually just about... We, we can use it now. Yeah, I mean, if I can just go back to the theme of resiliency, um, I think to me, resiliency is about a continuation of the operations, the activities, you know, the, the digital services that we have, um, despite of what's happening, whether we're going to the next lockdown, whether we're coming out from the lockdown. So if we can continue those services, if we can continue those operations, the productivity, that is what resilience is to, to me. And the other angle to that is coming out from a lockdown, for example, if we were to go to a next one, how fast do we pivot back to the activation phase? So how, how fast do we reactivate? And then that comes back to your question about, you know, social robots, because now I'm thinking if we're going to reactivate, say, an office, right, a, a workplace, then we have to make sure that with all the senses, um, all the aggregation of data and all the know-how and all the analysis, you know, um, with these social robots together with wearable senses, we are then able to tell the community that it is safe because we have an oversight of the traffic patterns. We have an oversight of uh, where people are actually going. Um, along with, you know, interactive wayfinder, which is another, you know, big area that tells you exactly where you need to, to go from A to B so you can, you know, minimize, you know, contact with, with other people. Um, that will give people the confidence to, to come back to work and reactivate very fast. Now, with regards to the social robot, I, I think, you know, uh, Australia uh, has been quite resistant to us, um, sort of humanoids, right, for example. Uh, not so much in Asia, in Japan, for example. And I think the resistance comes from the fact that uh, people fear that these robots um, not compensate, but um, supersede humans in a lot of the, the, the jobs. But in this case with COVID, you know, the, the social robots can help because they provide the interface between, say, an infected person or not infected person. And so we can use social robots, you know, in a lot of contexts. For example, they could be patrolling the... Uh, the halls of, you know, quarantine hotels, for example, right? Uh, but at the back end, we will have people monitoring that situation. So with regards to touchless, you know, these robots can be embedded with, you know, uh, UV disinfectant. They could be embedded with, you know, a, a virtual concierge. They can be embedded with biometric sensing, with thermal scanners. Uh, so the the opportunity to use them, and I'm hoping for more adoption, uh, it's, it's really there, you know, yeah. Thank you, Elaine. Thanks. So I might just come back to Lord Mayor. I think you mentioned um, safety and security uh, before as well. And then there was actually a question also from the audience about, what all these senses about pedestrian and everything is going to create, you know, help us uh, as well. So if you could probably link the, the intent of the, the pedestrian senses and how you are addressing the safety and security kind of dimension within the city. Good. Uh, Great. Well, look, the, uh, the sensors monitoring pedestrian activity, uh, they help us paint a picture of what's happening in the city and they also help us plan for the future of the city. In terms of painting a picture, uh, the uh, mid-lockdown and pandemic last year, we were able to reassure the state government that people were adhering to those uh, restrictions because our pedestrian footfall fell 93% on year-on-year -year comparisons. So that picture of the city, I didn't have to just paint it uh, for the Premier. I could actually give him hard data uh, to give reassurance about that. Uh, that's important in the sorts of discussions we're having then uh, in recovery, in terms of recovery. We can uh, see the picture each day in terms of the uplift. We're now starting to see it's gradual, but it, it is the momentum is going up. And we use that data in lots of ways. But most importantly for us at the moment is to give confidence to our city traders that we're seeing that pedestrian uh, data rise that gives them when they're making decisions every day about opening their doors, employing people, uh, some sense of what the future holds. And that's really important for us for the picture.
picture of what today looks like. In terms of planning, it's been absolutely central, that data, to our transport strategy for 2030. Uh, it's been so important for conversations uh, with car drivers particularly, uh, but just to uh, start to plan for the future around the fact that 89% of the trips done around the CBD are done by foot. So when we look then at the share of infrastructure, transport infrastructure available to pedestrians, it's much, much lower than what car transport currently has and public transport. So we're actually planning a city that increases the amount of space for pedestrians and you'll see that on streets such as Spencer Street at the moment where we're really pushing out those pavements. Of course, uh, we know that uh, where the, the bigger areas for uh, pedestrian density are, are the most used pedestrian places, and that's then really underpinned the work we've done around our hostile vehicle management uh, safety and security program. Where are we putting bollards? Uh, and that's uh, really driven a huge amount of investment into city safety. And it also helps us plan where our CCTV cameras go and we run the safe city control room. Uh, so those pedestrian traffic numbers give us uh, a better picture on where we need to be more aware uh, of safety and security around the city. So that just gives you a little bit of insight. But that data is published every day and we would love people to come onto our open data platform and show us different ways to use that data, come up with different ways in which it's meaningful and can be applied uh, and give us some ideas on other ways that we can use it. That'd be fantastic. Thank you. There's lots of questions keep coming. So let me um, throw some of them at you. So. Um, so one of the things I think it's related to your point earlier, there has been some people shifting to uh, the regional areas for lifestyle choices. And one of them they mentioned is, is maybe the green space uh, is what they were looking for. And I know the city of Melbourne for a long time had a greening initiative. So what, what can be done to kind of uh, improve the green assets of the city so that that lifestyle is also can be available within the city? Yeah. And our park usage went up exponentially, as you can imagine. A key bit of data for that was we used to collect two tonnes of rubbish per week from our city parks, and we're now collecting 10 tonnes of rubbish per week from our city parks. Uh, so uh, that, that usage, and it's, it's a natural thing. We saw that during lockdown. It isn't, I've, I've got to say, it's a challenge to create big new open spaces in the city. Uh, one way that we're doing that is taking back roads. There's a new urban park in Market Street in the CBD. South Bank Boulevard is almost two hectares of new open space by taking back roads and we're seeing that at University Square, Lincoln Square and Argyle Square right here around the University of Melbourne. What technology could be absolutely amazing at in transforming us into a greener city uh, is to look at vertical green gardens, is to look at green rooftops and the more extreme environments that, uh, that they um, create means that we're more reliant on technology and the designing, the planning and importantly the maintenance of those sorts of green spaces. Green vertical gardens we've seen in cities around the world, Singapore is a great example, but even New York uh, really rely on technology to, for the maintenance and ongoing upkeep of those gardens and we've still got a lot to learn there. So we have big ambitions uh, for new open spaces and we're grabbing that space where we can and turning it green. But how we look at existing buildings, particularly where 60% of our emissions come from existing buildings and make them greener with vertical wall gardens and green rooftops, um, that's something that we could really drive through more technology and innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, please. Chime in. Yeah. I mean, uh, we were looking at renovating our place and we found the Green Factor tool yeah. from the City of Melbourne. It was developed by the City of Melbourne and it was such a wonderful tool whereby we could actually, you know, put things like, you know, solar roof, um, you know, green vertical walls, energy efficient, you know, uh, sort of materials, right? And it will give us this green metric to see how green we are. But at the same time, it would tell us, you know, how much storm water we had, uh, potentially uh, heat mapping and things like that. I think allowing the users and the community um, to see the big picture of their footprint 
at the, the, the lowest granular level, which is at home, really does, you know, drive up the awareness. And I think, yeah. Brilliant answer. <laughs> we should have asked and Elaine at the start. No, well, <laughs> she's on the panel, so <laughs> she would. But I think that's wonderful to have that tool accessible that, mm. you know, we could use to say, this is my footprint, you know. And it's another it's good example of an application and a tool that has come from using the uh, open data platform. Oh, so really keen uh, for more of those sorts of applications to come forward. Uh, and really just finalised last year and now being used. So that's fantastic yeah. to hear. <laughs> but that's a good point, Elaine. I, I mean, I think what we're seeing is a lot of data going one direction. So you're counting footfall and it goes into the open data platform, but now you're getting interaction with the city and that would be great to get that bi-directional interaction. Here's what I'm putting in, here's what I'm getting out, here's how my community is building around me. I think mm -hmm. that's also key to, to building that resilience mm -hmm. and also bring people to be part of the actual city itself. Yeah, thank you. So, Simon, I think it's also a related issue, I think, given this, your interest in infrastructure and uh, transport, uh, the, the related to this um, energy efficiency things that you mentioned before, Elaine, um, how do you see the buildings actually would change with the adoption of some of these technologies in reducing the carbon footprint of relatively built city like Melbourne? What we're seeing a lot of interest around microgrids, um, their own renewable uh, buildings with their own renewable um, generation uh, and also storage. Uh, and then the next uh, iteration of that is, is really what do you do with your excess uh, generation? How can you actually use that to help drive your neighbours, help support other community members? So uh, microgrids, um, distributed energy generation, sort of the area, renewables is sort of the areas that we're seeing. Uh, Nikos, I think uh, Tulsa has been a, a big um, subscriber to zero emission network. And if you, as you're rolling out 5G and beyond, what the Tulsa sees about reducing its footprint and you know, uh, and making sure the telecom infrastructure, which is enabling everything, is become a very um, energy efficient. That's we've uh, we've gone crazy a bit, and we've declared uh, this uh, super aggressive target that by 2025 we'll be carbon neutral. Uh, we don't know how to get there. So, so let, me, let me say that up front because uh, we have stretched the limits of what we can do just, just to push the organization to achieve that goal. Um, I can tell you that in my organization alone, I'm, I'm the biggest uh, energy consumer, not only the, in the company, but one of the largest ones in the country. Uh, so I rank in the top five uh, energy consumers. So, so you can imagine my electricity bill that I get every month many, many zeros on it. So, so quite motivated, not only for, um, for the dollars, but for the environment as well. So what, what we're doing is uh, a, a ton of things. I mean, one is uh, uh, every piece of equipment that we buy now, a lot more conscious about what it burns. Um, how do you put a new uh, one in, one out? So in other words, so you can't just add things, you have to replace things. We're looking at, um, uh, we have created digital twins, and uh, I hope most people understand what that is. So we have replicas, digital replicas, if you will, of every building that we own, uh, especially in CBDs. And um, we manage the, the space now digitally. So you book your space, uh, heating, uh, air conditioning, air lights, everything work with uh, where the people are, when they are, and they don't just come on or off, and they just burn uh, uncontrollably. Uh, same thing for cars. We expect that uh, as people work from home more, we've seen a massive reduction uh, in, in car usage. Uh, um, in my household, we only have one car. I, I have a motorcycle and I take the train. So uh, you, you'll see more and more people going down the same path. Uh, so I think um, uh, our objective, as I said, is very, very aggressive. We have invested in renewable energy. Uh, both uh, wind and solar. And uh, we announced a few months ago that we are going to get into retail energy and that uh, is going to be all green. Now, on Australia, wow. a bit of problem uh, is that we don't have enough projects to generate that green energy. So we are compensated by buying you know, carbon credits uh, from other countries. But the ideal scenario is, of course, that uh, we find a way to drive... Australian generated green energy that complements uh, everything else we have. 
Thank you. And I think as you uh, were talking there, and I think you mentioned about the connectivity and the creating data platforms and open data and then building applications on things. So of course, there is a question coming about, um, you know, when we do integrating this technology and mass, mass, mass number of sensors capturing data, there is a citizen perspective on how is, is their activities being much more uh, being scrutinized or under observation. And so uh, they're asking your views on privacy and, um, you know, trying to avoid or at least sensitively recognize individuals' rights uh, of not being seen as a big brother kind of mentality. So any views on that, how we can manage the privacy expectations? Well, I think it comes down to transparency. Um, letting people know e exactly so actually, you're right, it comes down to transparency and it comes down to rights. Um, the right to know that you're getting collected, um, uh, that, that there's some data being collected around you, the right to know what it's being used for, the right to be able to go back and say to whoever's collecting it, I, I can delete it, and the right to look at the outcome of that data. I think that that's, that's important in terms of what we do. Yep. All right. I can jump in if you yeah, want sure, us. Um, privacy, I mean, we are a highly regulated industry, so as you can imagine, uh, even when we were looking at uh, the COVID app uh, by the government, you won't believe the, the number of discussions we had as to how we did not feel comfortable in sharing, for example, location data or people data with anybody, including our own government, because ultimately it's, it's not ours, it's, it belongs to, to the individual. Um, so privacy is, is an extremely important factor as we collect the data. And uh, there are two initiatives that I think all of us are driving. One is anonymized data. So we just don't know who it is. We just know they did something. Um, I'll give you an example similar to what uh, the city has done. We have deployed, uh, uh, not permanently, it's just uh, trials. Uh, we can measure every footfall, every car, everything that goes in most of Melbourne now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and this technology is really to see if we can uh, track movements of lots of objects, in, including cars. Um, you, 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 can't, you can't know who it is. You just know a footfall happened or a truck passed by or a train or whatever. It's that kind of data thing that's interesting to us where it's about uh, uh, anonymized data. It, it's not about the individual. So there's also a related question of, of um, you know, we're generating um, zillions of data with this way. And do we really, uh, like the city of Melbourne, for example, do we really have the bandwidth to process it or what technologies are there really dealing with that? No, I was going to talk about the, the no. digital privacy. Yeah, Sorry, sure, sure, sure. please. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, Nick has talked about, you know, the network and, you know, there's also IoT, but I would like to also, you know, come from the angle of, of a tech creator, for example, I think a lot of work has gone into, you know, making it security based, right? Or make, making that tech secure. Um, but I think we also need to start approaching it from a value based design, uh, from a rights based design, uh, and as well as an accessibility based design. Uh, and when we do that, and when we are actually, you know, collecting personal data, even though anonymized, you know, we still have geolocation and tagging and things like that, it has to be limited, it has to be temporary, and I think it has to be highly supervised. And I think, yeah, that, to, to me, that's really important, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So maybe I'll, I'll just cover some quick questions about, uh, I think the, the there are, what we see is and what we hear is there are amazing tech products and solutions that can be done. But the, the question is about could an event be held um, to really bring these uh, solution providers and the, the city that needs the solutions so that we can evaluate them? Well, we do have uh, this hackathon coming up yep. uh, and we'd encourage everybody to get involved. It's the 
biggest one of its kind that we've run. And again, it came from a, an idea during forums uh, through COVID. Uh, if there are ideas on other ways that we can do it, using technology as well uh, to uh, uh, encapsulate ideas from everywhere, then that would be uh, fantastic. We're certainly open to all of that because, to your point, the gazillions amount, amounts of information uh, and sources are out there. How do we best take that and apply it into something that delivers value is, is something we're interested in. And we're very conscious also of the pace at which we can do that because the pace of our recovery will really uh, add a lot to the momentum of this city and a sense of opportunity in this city uh, for the future. Um, the other element I was going to say uh, is that one of the real challenges and around resilience in terms of uh, responding to crisis is how do we how do we provide information to people? How do we engage with people during a crisis? We can't really anticipate many of these um, events that are going to happen to us. We'd like to, but we can't always. How we respond to those events is really important. And our ability to connect with, provide information to, and then engage with community members, people that don't receive their information through traditional media channels, or they're not signed up to a newsletter at the City of Melbourne or they're not on a Cisco database, the ability for us to respond effectively is highly dependent on how we mobilise those people. So using technology and an opt-in, we don't want to breach anybody's privacy, but a really understanding what are those applications and use of technology to be able to disseminate information quickly and receive information effectively is something we are really focused on because we were very aware of the challenges around that as we headed into the COVID crisis. Uh, and I know that it's a distinctive piece in a lot of the responses to whether it's bushfires or earthquakes or tsunamis uh, or pandemics around the world. Um, we also saw it in the particular circumstance of the, of the hard lockdown in our public housing towers. Uh, we should have known every single person we should have been able to communicate effectively with them like that and the challenges around how we mobilise those efforts because we didn't have that sort of uh, communication ability uh, really made it very frustrating and unfortunately, um, you know, some, some um, non-desirous impacts as a result. Yep. I think Telstra, so Cisco, you guys involved in many events are bringing different industry stakeholders together. Is there anything that is, you see an importance in bringing um, these solutions on the spotlight? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess to go back to the point of aims, I mean, that's why we're, we're doing it. So community can see what we're up to, can see what that next iteration of technology is and get their feedback as well. You know, that, that is very important. I think there's a few other events on um, as well. I can't remember, not off the top of my head, but, but you know, that's lots of opportunities that uh, we take to present what we're up to and, and also um, uh, get community uh, involved as well. Yep. All right. There's another broader question, I guess, it, you know, we talked about census a lot and, and uh, there's a question around uh, the different people, cities uh, deploying its sensors and of course uh, network itself has sensors of our things and you know transport and building infrastructure and you know green assets have sensors. So who actually pays for it and how these things are maintained so that we can actually continue to uh, you know uh, have the data or oh, relevant data, valid data coming out of these sensors? Wow. Well, if technology could solve the uh, <laughs> conundrum of how we pay for these things, that would be brilliant. Yep. Uh, certainly, we're all drawing from our own budgets uh, to install uh, and maintain. And of course, it's not just maintaining of the sensors themselves, but it's the information that comes in and being able to upload and, and maintain that. So at the moment, uh, I think we're all probably constrained by our own budgets rather than our own imagination. Yeah. Uh, and uh, perhaps the, the point of that question is, is how do we pull more of these resources to make sure uh, we're getting uh, those effective outcomes? I think what's uh, been apparent to us through the 5G uh, IoT testbed here in in Melbourne uh, by bringing industry uh, at the university and uh, local government together is just how much of that sharing could happen. Uh, so we're actually leveraging more of the benefits rather than the, the setup costs and, and maintenance costs. 
I think um, in in the conversation a little bit earlier, uh, Lord Mayor, you said you know bringing people back into the city and the events is uh, really at the heart of the city's um, kind of heartbeat. So I'm really asking what technologies could be there to kind of help us to attract more people into the city or run events in a hybrid mode, uh, where where we see the role of technologies in you know really reactivating an event city back back to its full glory, I guess. Mm. Well, look, I'll kick off with some examples and I'd love to hear other ways that we can do it. Uh, our fashion festival that would normally bring in 150,000 people into the city, uh, we held it in November. We're up to scenario 26 on how we could actually hold that event. Uh, and we had small elements of it in person, but the, the bigger part of the program this year was... Uh, was all online, so 32 different runway shows. And uh, we did that so we could support the industry uh, and so that we could reach people that, that couldn't get into the city at the time. What we found from that program is actually there were thousands of people internationally involved in our fashion festival that normally we'd be reliant on them flying in. And that is a, a, a very positive outcome because the reach uh, was really extended. Uh, but the challenge remains, how do we get that good mix of people coming together whilst taking the benefits of, of how we can extend Pause Fest, which is an annual uh, event here in Melbourne, normally tens of thousands of people coming together uh, as tech geeks uh, to talk about innovation. Uh, this year, it was completely delivered online uh, over 10 days, an amazing feat of those organisers to be able to deliver that. And uh, I feel that whilst we talked about a lot of things that were happening in Melbourne, we really missed um, that, that collision and the sparks that happen when people come together. So I think it's, we're looking for good ideas on the right mix of both of those things because uh, the in-person and the online have their benefits, but they also have their challenges. Yeah, we're seeing that a lot as well. Once people are over the hump of, hey, this is a, a virtual event and we're not really there, we're now seeing um, people say, oh, how do I interact more with it? And, and so uh, a lot of our technology is now pivoting towards uh, people being able to poll in, in real time and interact in real time and, and put their emotions into it real time. And, and just to, uh, to sort of highlight back to that tech acceleration point of view and, and where we're going, um, we, we did our first um, hologram, full person hologram um, uh, session uh, between Milan and San Jose in California. And that's sort of where the technology is going. They're going, okay, we're going to have a full person there. They don't have to be in the same room, but it's enough there to interact and, and keep that sort of momentum alive and interaction. Mm. Because you guys are behind uh, major sporting events all the time. So what's the Telstra? Sporting events, <laughs> art events. Uh, so I'm going to give an answer that's not technology based, because if we're going to pull people in the city, it can be about virtual events. I mean, we all love them. We all do them. But if you want people to come in, there's got to be something else. So we, we are experimenting with a couple of ideas, uh, Lord Mayor. One is, uh, uh, as we look at the many buildings that we occupy uh, uh, around the CBD, and as we are contracting, what do we do with those buildings? So one of the ideas we are experimenting is, um, we have uh, observed an increased efficiency in delivery, velocity of delivery, if you will, um, when we put all our partners together in a single space um, to the tune of 15 to 20% improvement in productivity. So, so we're looking at the spaces, and instead of saying it's gonna be a Telstra building with Telstra employees, it's gonna be a collaboration building where Cisco and Telstra and, I don't know, Infosys and AWS and Microsoft and come together to deliver what we want. And, and, and that proximity drives tremendous benefits. So, so we're looking at that. And the other idea we're experimenting with is uh, uh, as space becomes more available, again, because of contra contraction, um, can we use them to have a pop-up um, startups space? So we used to call them incubators and all these kind of things, but they are typically you know, hidden somewhere. Uh, wh why not pull them into the center of the city and really drive that young, innovative workforce uh, into the CBD? Just a couple of thoughts. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. And um, 
we've already touched on, but I think there are a few people raised on that issue of um, the city is one of its advantage, I think Lord Mayor, you mentioned uh, as knowledge workers and concentration of it, and we've been hit hard a little bit because of the the restrictions. But uh, you also outlined at the women at the right at the start what city is doing about you know uh, creating that connection to innovation back again, and you mentioned hackathon and things. So there were people were kind of trying to explore how to bring the people with ideas. And, and, and the people who need the solutions. And I think the hackathon is, is a great idea. And, uh, you know, I guess, you know, you're at Tulsa, you have Innovation Lab or, or you know, a, st a startup ecosystem that you're nurturing as well. And Cisco, you've actually picked certain domains of expertise around Australia and creating it. So I'm trying to throw back at you to see, reflect on your experiences, how effective they are and what we need to be doing in order to, you know, bootstrap more collaboration, as you put it, yeah. Yeah, well, look, I love the prompt. I mean, if we want more reasons to come in to bring uh, solution prov providers to uh, those that are experiencing challenges, that's absolutely fantastic. I mean, we've got so many brilliant spaces, this being one of them here at Melbourne Connect, to be able to do that. And increasingly, we've got space to be able to do that. One, uh, I guess, other element I was going to add to this is that we sort of we tend to look to sectors and say, oh, it'll be uh, a tech accelerator. Is that it? Tech acceleration, uh, and we think of the tech sector. Uh, but um, what we're mindful of is that uh, many of the, I call it a renaissance, city renaissances, happen with an understanding that, that creativity at its very base is really important for times of disruption. And there are so many different types of people organisations, sectors that have creativity at its base. And so a big part of what we're doing going forward is looking at what may be those available spaces and how do we fill them with more artists, with more creative organisations, with cultural and community organisations that together with tech and tech startups and, and entrepreneurs, even social enterprises, we're the home of social enterprises here in Melbourne and we really have, it's been organic, we haven't been deliberate about that. How do we bring uh, all of those elements together uh, to see what we can achieve to really drive that renaissance. And interestingly, a lot of those types of organisations need subsidised space or cheaper space to be able to come in. And it's terrific to hear that so many of our larger organisations who may not need the same amount of space going forward are opening up their doors to welcome uh, organisations in at subsidised or, or uh, a cheaper rents. Uh, we know we're liaising with a lot of those big organisations around town. And in the month of January alone, we had 652 inquiries from those smaller businesses looking for tips on where to go to be able to find those cheaper spaces. So the co-working spaces, all of those sort of innovation incubators, et cetera, I think we will see a drive for more of that space and how we curate the activities in those spaces is going to be a big responsibility, something we would love to do with partners uh, like all of us here. Can I sign you up while I'm here? Uh, to uh, delivering uh, more of the, and they are, they're the compelling reasons that would bring people into the city is to actually have those sorts of discussions and interactions. Can I also add yeah, to that? Please. I think as much as we support the entrepreneurial and the startup um, sort of sector, whether it's, you know, tech, or whether it's you know creative arts, I think we need to incentivize for them to develop the IP and to commercialize the IP here in Melbourne. So we can have them, you know, with subsidized space, but we need to make sure that you know the the subsequent stages of the entire product stays in Melbourne. Mm. I think that's important too. That pathway. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Agree. We're at the launch of a new AI uh, fund. Uh, the other night uh, that we're supporting as well. University of Melbourne's involved. Your tentacles are everywhere. Uh, and uh, we we had a pitch as part of the event and it was just fantastic uh, to see those ideas coming through. But we have to acknowledge that the commercialisation pathway is still very limited here in Melbourne and our access to uh, particularly venture funds, or I call them adventure funds even, uh, is still very shallow. And that support network, even who owns the IP, 
and how do we share IP more generously on the basis that it might be a catalyst uh, for commercialisation of something else. It's, it's those sorts of things that I think we, we could put in some extra effort. I think we are, the time is really um, running fast, or at least fe uh, feels like running fast because we've got a lot of things to talk about it. But one of the things I think maybe we could uh, finish up on uh, on it that um, you, uh, uh, during your uh, uh, being the mayor of the city, uh, you put the social response of city has been, I think, during the huge impact of COVID-19, city of Melbourne should be congratulated the way that it has dealt with the most vulnerable part of the community. So I think, the, I think uh, many of you have talked about digital inclusiveness mm -hmm. and uh, addressing the gap, but uh, in particular, I think that uh, has been uh, really welcome. So I guess how we... Uh, how and different ways we can continue to make sure that the older community is being able to uh, be taken along the technological uh, innovations that we do within the city would be important. So it's more of an open question, so feel free to uh, project any views. Well, look, access to information and knowledge uh, through the use of technology and having the infrastructure uh, to enable people is key. And I think that really came out during COVID. Uh, so uh, for us, there's a, a big challenge there and other tiers of government uh, to be able to do that. Uh, and, and that gives a sense of equity across opportunity as well then, if there, there is th th those resources are available. But to extend the point as well, how do we use technology to really tackle some of those big conundrums uh, that we faced? One of the reasons why people are choosing regional rural lifestyles is because they don't like the commute uh, that happens with congestion. Technology can help us rid ourselves of congestion forever if we could actually have applications that guided people to good times to get on trains or trams, uh, good times to travel in uh, in their cars. Uh, we can really extend that peak because people can work fl more flexibly uh, and we shouldn't understate uh, issues like congestion and, and the challenges that they pose for modern cities and our own productivity and our own sense of happiness and satisfaction. So there are those elements. But for us, um, during COVID, 100% of people uh, rough sleeping on our streets were in accommodation, safe accommodation and receiving support services. We got to know these people literally by name, but uh, that situation will change and we want to be able to use technology and harness uh, better systems and innovation for maintaining contact and connection, for better managing uh, services and for better identifying uh, appropriate accommodation. And we're at ground zero on that. So those are very, very important social issues where we would love to see some uh, innovation through technology. Yeah, I think it's been a really interesting discussion. I think we can keep discussing for, um, for a longer time, but I think uh, we do hope this panel session puts a spotlight on key areas. And I think you, all of you have articulated very nicely the opportunities and the, 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 the availability of technologies, but also what potential impact it can have in a very short period of time. And um, you, all of you brought the importance of collaboration between different parts of the community, both tech uh, providers, but also people with startup and ideas, social enterprises, and the community itself. Uh, and and the city is already uh, really uh, leading as an example in terms of coordinating and, and you know also maintaining coordination between different levels of government. And I think it's we can clearly see the city of Melbourne has led that. It and it shows it's, we can do better as well, though. So that's that, great. That's, that's really great. So uh, I'm really grateful for you dedicating your time to be here and to share with the, a large number of audience uh, who have joined us. And uh, it's really uh, been a very interesting set of questions. As I promised at the start, uh, we will not be able to cover everything in a panel session, but we hope this actually uh, creating a spotlight and an immense opportunities that we uh, all different parts of the system can collaborate and work together. So we look forward to following up on this important uh, conversation. Again, thank you for the audience who have uh, joined us remotely and also put forward a really long list of questions for us to ponder. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thanks.